All right, so we'll um, set our motivation. So just get yourself gathered. So once again, in a heartfelt way, thinking of the four measurable thoughts. May all sentient beings possess happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings not be separated from happiness that is free of suffering. May they abide with equanimity, free from attachment, hatred, and indifference. So just letting that settle in for a moment. Can you hear me over the children's uh, music? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so last Wednesday you were looking at that refuge class series um, still, and in that class there was a discussion about the five refuge lay vows and um, kind of the purpose of taking vows, even if you're a lay person, not a monastic. And, um, you know, it's just kind of an idea of what reinforces refuge for a Buddhist. And, you know, one of the points of the curriculum of this semester is to really investigate your own inner refuge. And so I'm kind of, you know, offering the Buddhist perspective and the Buddhist style and kind of the procedures and ceremonies that we go through as just kind of an invitation for you to look at your own stuff not in any way to be a missionary or to get you to convert to Buddhism, okay? So <laughs> if no one in the class becomes Buddhist, that is completely fine with me. But what I do hope is that you have some sort of deep inner refuge that nourishes you and then helps you with your work for others. So hopefully by looking at the Buddhist view, you can then come to your own decisions and kind of look at your own framework and see what can be strengthened and what can be more powerful. So I thought to just very briefly review those lay vows and see if you had any ideas or questions that came up. So on Wednesday you were looking at these, so these vows that Buddhists can take in addition to the refuge precept are pradamoksha vows, which means vows of individual liberation common to all forms of Buddhism. So those refuge vows um, may be in the Theravadan tradition, they may be in the Mahayana tradition, Pali tradition, Sanskrit tradition, all the traditions agree that these vows of individual liberation are important and powerful and that they are ways for you to move your mind towards nirvana. So the refuge precept itself is becoming a Buddhist. And this involves committing to the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, as your primary source of spiritual refuge. But it doesn't mean you can't use other tools or that you can't draw from other things, but it's talking about your core values. So there's a difference between the refuge precept and taking the refuge lay vows. They usually go together, but they don't have to. Um, you can become a Buddhist and take the refuge precept all by yourself in your room, privately with no one watching except for the Buddhas, just a completely private experience. Or you could do it in a temple with a group of people. You can do it in such a way that you're also connecting with a teacher and a lineage, but it doesn't have to be that way. And different traditions of Buddhism organize the ceremony for taking refuge or being a Buddhist differently. So, for example, when I first became Buddhist when I was 12 in Helena, Montana, with the local Zen Buddhist group, because that was the only Buddhists in town that I could find, we said these precepts to each other, and we kind of bore witness to each other. And there was a sort of a leader of the group, but he was much more like a facilitator, and it was just a group of people that would meditate together once a week, and every couple of months have a weekend retreat, with a real Zen Roshi that we'd bring in from California. But most of the time it was just like this guy who was an English teacher at the high school who would like read books to us and then we'd sit and meditate. 
and it was it was a beautiful little group and it was consistent and it was a sangha and when we did the refuge ceremony there was no lineage per se that we were connecting to we were just kind of going straight to the source committing to the buddha in a really personal one-on-one -on -one way in tibetan buddhism it's much more likely to be an event <laughs> with a big lama who you are also taking as your guru at the same time as taking uh, refuge in the buddha dharma and sangha and again you don't have to do it that way but the benefit of that way is that you're not only connecting to the teacher but you're connecting to the unbroken oral tradition from shakyamuni buddha to the present day and there's a belief that that gives more power and foundation and strength because of the continuity of practitioners. So lots of ways to take refuge, personal ways, private ways, but to take the vows, usually they are given by someone who holds the lineage of them. But again, there's variation in different traditions. So the particular vows that can be added to refuge um, they're the basis, okay? So lay people can also take higher vows like bodhisattva vows and tantric vows, but having refuge is a prerequisite to these higher vows. So you have to at least have refuge if you want these higher commitments. So at the refuge ceremony, these pradamoksha vows, one can take any, none, or all immediately after the main refuge ceremony. So they are not to kill, not to steal, not to lie, not to engage in sexual misconduct, and not to take in intoxicants, which is a branch. And for one through four, a dramatic intentional action must be done to break at the root. And to break at the root means that one no longer has the vow. For number five, the intoxicant vow, this is not a natural misdeed or included in the 10 non-virtues. Refraining from intoxicants supports keeping the others as well as maintaining clarity, but there's no discussion of breaking it from the root. You either broke it or you didn't, but it's not as heavy as the other ones. The other ones are negative to do even if you don't have a vow. Number five is only negative to do if you have a vow not to. So like that. Okay, so before we do review of Monday's class, was there anything about those refuge vows that intrigued you or that confused you? I mean, it's quite straightforward, right? But do you see how aligning your beliefs in that way reinforces your refuge? that being more purposeful gives power. It's really relying on this power of promises psychology that if you kind of incidentally don't hurt anyone and you, you know, are not particularly taking people for granted, you're relatively honest, that's good. That accumulates good karma. But if you're proactively promising, it has so much more strength and momentum and continuity. Even though your daily life might not dramatically change, somehow there's more power when you promise. So were any of those um, ones that you wanted to unpack further? Did it make sense the difference between transgressing, which you can repair, and breaking from the root, meaning you've lost the vow? So then I'm curious if there's any parallels when you become a psychologist or a psychoanalyst, like when you become a doctor and you take the Hippocratic Oath, you know, that starts with first do no harm. When you become an analyst, is there some sort of assumed set of ethics that you all agree to adhere to as practitioners? Or is it just kind of like a general idea of ethics, confidentiality, but it's kind of abstract? Or do you have something really specific about your ethics when you become an analyst? 
things that everyone would agree to. Besides, yeah, generally be ethical, generally keep confidentiality, but anything aside from that or more specific to that? Do you feel like there should be, or do you feel like there's no need? There is in the law that I, I, that you can't, if you are a therapist, not to have a, not to be engaged in a sexual relationship with your patients. Oh, good. Yeah, that seems like a bad idea. Yeah, <laughs> good. So that's explicitly in there. Yeah. Good, excellent. <laughs> oh I mean, so their laws are they? Their their laws or are they agreements or assumptions or promises? It's in the law. It's, it's the law. Oh yeah. And if it were not the law, you would still think it's a bad idea. I would assume, <laughs> right? Um, is there are there things about? your financial arrangement or things about your, you know, personal, I don't know, boundaries or anything that, that kind of gets explicitly talked about? Or is it just assumed that because you are already involved with psychology, you know about good boundaries and you're gonna behave yourself? Our commitment to uh, the highest degree of empathy uh, influence our way, the way we are with our patients. So it can influence also our financial arrangements and so on, sometimes. Yeah. So this idea of aspiring to the highest degree of empathy, is that something that is explicitly agreed upon by all analysts? No, self-analyst, uh, it would be, it would. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to look at, you know, what is kind of common in the secular world compared to what is common in the religious or the spiritual world and maybe the benefits and disadvantages of each. Um, you know, lots of lay people have marriage vows, for example, but not everyone in a relationship has marriage vows. And everyone has their own relationship to promises and commitments. And I think what's really important to understand in Buddhism that promises and commitments are all to move you towards your fullest potential. And if you already had achieved your fullest potential, if you already were a Buddha, there would be no need to have vows. So there's a built-in assumption that you will transgress them, that you will not be perfect. But to actually lose the vow, it has to be very intentional, very purposeful. So like, you know, to break the killing vow is not accidentally stepping on ants. It's plotting to murder someone and doing that on purpose and being happy about it, right? So like, it takes a lot to break it. But the built in assumption is that we transgress these things all the time in a million different ways, but being aligned with wanting to come back to a core set of ethics builds power. So I think for regular people who are generally ethical, the most, I guess, intriguing one becomes the vow not to lie. And from a Buddhist perspective, the vow not to lie is very, very important, um, but to break it at the root is to lie about spiritual attainments. And I think that is very intriguing to bring a secular conversation into that. Because in the secular world, spiritual attainments are not a conversation topic, right? It's not like you're talking about, here's how my meditation's going, or here's my level of concentration. But it might be that you are dishonest in the way that you convey your level of understanding. That you might make out that you understand more about someone than you do, or that you understand more about psychology than you do, or that you're more decisive than you actually are when offering suggestions or something like that. And I think that 
whatever your version of that is, that's the place of investigation because whether we like it or not, we are in a leadership position as caregivers. Even though we don't like hierarchy, you as analysts, me as a nun, that's a position of some sort of authority, which means that our lies have a bigger impact and our dishonesty is more powerful and more painful and more problematic because of the authority that we have. And so really looking at what am I conveying and why? And even if it's on the surface honest, am I, is there a level of deception that is, I don't know, coming from insecurity or coming from arrogance, same thing, right? Or is it coming from, I really wanna help and so maybe this will help, but all these mixed motivations around why we are not always honest, I think becomes a very important in our conversation because we are in these positions of power. So in terms of your work, this is important in terms of your life, of course, generally, but in terms of your work, are there common places where deception could come in? And I'm not saying, you know, reveal all of your darkest secrets. I'm saying in general, where could you see the potential for dishonesty in your work creeping in the most regularly? Sometimes people do really horrible things in life and then someone tells you that they feel very bad about something they did or very guilty and sitting in front of it and really being able to see it with them. It's probably mostly it's the right thing to do, not just tell someone it's not too bad what you did. Sometimes people do really bad things and what helps them is someone agreeing to see it with them but i think for me it's a difficult moment sometimes to really you know not to just um to calm the person the other person down yeah. or to say it's okay i mean yeah you yeah exactly okay, but now it's it wasn't okay what you did it's it's, it's difficult to, to look at it together for me sometimes <laughs> i need to take a big breath Absolutely. And, and I think this is the, the key point that I was hoping that you would move towards. And it's, it's the same in Buddhism where there are layers of vows. So the first layer are these refuge vows of individual liberation, which are very black and white. Don't lie. <laughs> and then there's bodhisattva vows, which say generally don't lie unless there's a higher purpose. And then the example is given of, maybe I've given you this example before, of during the time of the Buddha, there was a prince of a small kingdom who killed his mother and father because he wanted to become king. And then after he killed his mother and father, he suddenly became grief stricken and crazy and wanted to kill himself because he realized what he did was so terrible. And so this prince was in this terrible state having murdered his family and he was sent to the Buddha. And the Buddha said to him, and he was very crazed still at this point, the Buddha said, don't worry, mother and father are to be killed. <laughs> and because this prince had faith in the Buddha, it gave him a moment to breathe. And then the Buddha said, mother and father, I mean karma and disturbing emotions. <laughs> Karma and disturbing emotions are to be killed. And that is what we are born from. And so, you know, he gave kind of in a way a surface lie to settle the mind and to kind of embrace and accept the person until they relaxed enough to hear the deeper layer of wisdom. Right. And so we talk about this a lot in Buddhism of when are we transgressing a lower vow in favor of a higher purpose? And when are we just justifying because we're lazy or afflicted? Because you're the only one that knows if you're having a bodhicitta motivation for leaving behind a pradamoksha vow in favor of a bodhisattva vow. You're the only one that knows. For the monastic community, the monks and nuns, the example always given is about how theoretically um, you're not supposed to make physical contact with people of the opposite gender. 
right? Theoretically. Of course, Tibetan Buddhists are the most relaxed of all the Buddhists in terms of this, and you'll see His Holiness the Dalai Lama hug people and shake the hands of people of all genders, and it's no big deal. But technically, we're not supposed to make contact with people of the other gender because it's problematic and it leads to all sorts of things you can imagine, right? So the example given is there were two monks on a journey and they see a woman drowning in the, in the river. She's about to die. She's in the river about to be swept away. And one monk jumps in the river to save her and then puts her down on the other side of the river. And then his friend says, I cannot believe you transgressed the training of touching a woman. I can't believe you did that. And of course, the good monk says, I put her down on the other side of the river. You're still carrying her with us. You know, and it's a, it's a point about how it's all about context. It's all about context. And so keeping in alignment with, am I operating from the highest context or am I skipping essential steps? So this is the basic training when we're talking about vows in Buddhism, they're layered and there's always conditions apply and the assumption is you will transgress them but it's still worthwhile keeping the continuity of them because it builds power any any questions or thoughts can you hear me just barely yeah okay i i, I wanted to ask about uh, not sharing uh, your experience, uh, do you share your experiences uh, with your guru, teacher? Oh, allow? right. Um, certainly you can share your, your meditation experiences or if you have realizations, you can share them with your teacher or privately with peers if it's like a conversation about logistics. Like I'm at this level and I'm stuck. What's the thing to do? What's the antidote? What's the support? Or I think I've achieved this. The criteria is this. Do you think that's right? Or have I not achieved it yet? But it's much more um, like a collaborative conversation about progress on the path. The reason that we don't share that stuff in general is because there's no way for anyone else to check if what we're saying is true. And if people believe that we have realizations, they're going to put us up so high that the danger is we start a cult. You know, so it's um, it's the agreement of Buddhists, not necessarily a vow, but it's the agreement that we don't talk about realizations. And if someone asks us if we have realizations, we say no, even if that's a lie, because the danger is so high if people elevate you too much. It just opens up the door for so much vulnerable people being taken advantage of that it's just the, the default position. Don't share your meditative experiences. The most we'll say is so far so good, <laughs> right? Seems to be helping. I'm better than I started out as. But what that means specifically it, it's not a good idea to share because also what can happen is if you talk about your experiences that are very personal and magical and profound to you, other people might say, oh, that's not a big deal. Oh yeah. And then you feel sort of sad that your practice is deficient or not as special as you thought, or they don't understand or empathize in the right way. They don't know how to mirror you, right? Because it's just so out of their experience. So it's one of these things where it's not like you can't ever talk about what's going on with your experiences. It's just be so careful who you're talking to and probably never do it in a large group. Because certainly I didn't have any realization, right? But I, I, we are uh, trying to uh, develop a theory and it's very difficult not to do it without talking about the experience and without I I feel I lack a guru okay I really feel it that I lack this uh, person that I can feel things like uh, 
Yeah, yeah, it's it's a real thing, and um, you know, I I I was Buddhist all of my teenage years for seven eight years before I found my guru, and it was still the most important thing in my life. I loved it more than anything else. It's what I gave my whole heart to, and I desperately wanted a teacher, but I didn't have a teacher for the first seven or eight years of intensive practice. But I had a lot of mentors. And I had peers that I could talk to about stuff. And that's completely fine. And that's helping with progress. But for the conditions to come together for a guru, you have to be kind of proactive. You know, they're not going to just land in your lap. You have to start kind of checking it out. I mean, I didn't want to live in Australia. <laughs> I had no urge to move to Australia. I just thought I will visit Australia because I hear there is a valid guru there who has a translator and there's a community there where you can study. So I'll just check and it turned out to be a good fit. But I mean, so, you know, there, there's sacrifices I made because the teacher interaction was so important to me. So, you know, for all of us, there's some sort of sacrifice, but you're sacrificing some samsaric crumbs of happiness in favor of the deep happiness that comes from practice. So then it winds up not really being a sacrifice. But you know, you have to be purposeful and look for them and research and check. And it can be a huge hassle and a huge inconvenience, but the benefit is huge, you know? So um, I know it's frustrating because in Israel, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of access, but actually some really amazing llamas come through here. So, yeah. Anyway, don't be passive. If you want one, go hunting. Yes. And in the meantime, you can talk to your friends like, I have trouble focusing on this kind of meditation, and this kind of meditation seems to be easier. That's okay. As long as you're not saying, I have realized, you know, that's the problem. Or if you start saying things like, why are we meditating on love all the time? I'm never angry. That would just be poignant because you don't have enough self-awareness to know your own anger. <laughs> Right? So those kind of things, whatever. We're all friends here. We can just talk it out. I'm talking realizations are best not to talk about. I don't know. Did that, did that clarify the position? Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, there is part of us always seeking transcendence and to be inspired. But the problem is charisma can convince us of many things that are not true. We're very vulnerable on our spiritual path, even if we're very good with our common sense in general, even if we're very grounded, wise people in general. When it comes to the spiritual path, there's a newness to it and a freshness to it. And we're like babies and we're so vulnerable that it makes sense to be as careful as you can be when placing reliance on anything or anyone. And so there's just a lot of safeguards to prevent Buddhist communities from turning into cults. And particularly in Tibetan Buddhism where the guru is elevated so much so, we have more safeguards because human nature, you know, there's gonna be terrible people with the name guru. It's just normal, isn't it? But if you're, you know, in a vulnerable state, who really seeking transcendence and really wanting elevated states of mind, you want to believe, you know, and it makes, it's dangerous. So common sense is very important. <laughs> Um, so last week we were talking about near enemies and far enemies of immeasurables. And I think it's pretty, you know, clear kind of concept, but it'll keep getting repeated for all of the immeasurables. So just to make sure it's really clear, the near enemies are what look like what we want to cultivate, but are not it. They prevent or inhibit the development of it, but are harder to identify because until they're thwarted, they really feel like the same thing. Just like attachment feels like love until attachment doesn't get what it wants, then it turns into anger. Whereas when love doesn't get what it wants, 
it re us you know kind of rejigs its plan it kind of comes to new ideas it becomes creative but it's not angry and then the far enemies are the opposite of what we want to cultivate the other end of the energy they stand in direct opposition to what we seek to develop and are more obvious and easy to identify so opposites are easy so the point here is that the confusions we have about our own experiences lead us to mislabel and then seek or avoid them. And we get these repetitions and repetitions and do the same thing again and again because we're confused about our own experience. We mislabel our own experience. So near enemies that look like love but are not love we had attachment is the classic, that wish to possess or be close to, which exaggerates the person and their positive impact, but also pride plus attachment, which can misunderstand the warmth that can come with ego satisfaction, right? So tying in the conversation about the eight worldly concerns, if people are validating you and lifting you up and telling you that you're amazing, it can engage both your pride and your attachment and you get this warm feeling, but it's not love because it's fragile and built on exaggeration. So while it's all happening, it feels lovely, but then the other end of it is usually some kind of like depressive state or disappointed resentment. And then we get pleasure plus attachment which misidentifies a condition as a cause. And this is much more common. So what we have is like a nice feeling in the body, a nice feeling in the mind. It's pleasant. And it's pleasant at the same time as being with somebody or doing something or consuming something. And so then we assume somewhat logically that the reason I feel pleasant is because of those things or that person that person or those things gave me this experience. And it's mislabeling a condition and calling it the cause. Yeah, that makes sense. So this is what we're doing all day, every day. We're saying, I'm happy because of my coffee. And you're like, no, you're happy because positive seeds are ripening and coffee was one of the conditions. And you have all sorts of associations and conditioning with coffee, which is why it works, but you had to have the positive karmic seed there Otherwise it wouldn't. And if it really was the cause, you could have only coffee all day, every day, and there would be no problems with your digestion. <laughs> and obviously that is not the case, right? So the near enemy is the one that we have to find. Um, the far enemy is obvious, but we need to make sure that it's clear to us how the logic underneath it is flawed. So your Wednesdays are gonna shift from refuge in bodhicitta to really looking at anger because anger is one of the most problematic ones because it's so easy to justify. So there'll be a lot of sessions on undermining the fuel of anger. Okay, but anger is the obvious far enemy of love. So the opposites. So anger is the opposite of love because it wishes to harm, right? Love wants happiness, anger wishes to harm. So it exaggerates the person and their negative impact. So it has this like punishing perspective. And then we get pride plus anger, which misunderstands that cold deflated feeling that comes with a thwarted ego. So when we're criticized, our pride is annoyed and our anger is annoyed and they all come together to say, you will not get happiness from me. Or you get pain plus anger, which similarly misidentifies a condition as a cause. Okay, so now that you understand this near enemy, far enemy thing, what is the near enemy of compassion? Switching from love to compassion. What are things that look like compassion, but are not compassion? Yeah, so we're remembering compassion is the wish for sentient beings to be free from suffering. So what's something that looks like it, but isn't? Maybe pity. Maybe pity. Pity, yeah. Pity is, is perfect, yep. Yeah, what else? Attachment. Yeah. Yep. 
Yep. Maybe the colloquial idea of empathy. Yeah, the way you guys describe empathy is maybe more like compassion, but there's an idea in the world that if you're feeling with, that that is compassion. And that, of course, can lead to empathic distress and over-identification. And you get people who say there is compassion fatigue. And from a Buddhist perspective, there is no such thing as compassion fatigue, because you do not become fatigued by having compassion. But you do become fatigued by having empathic distress, 100%. They're very different things. Part of what makes you fatigued is struggling against impossible things and it not working. You want someone to be free from suffering and you're trying to strategize how to fix them or fix this or fix you or somehow fix and you're getting all tangled in worldly strategies and you're over identifying their suffering as who they are. And that's exhausting to bear witness to. It's depressing, it's poignant, it makes you melancholy, and that is tiring. But compassion sees all of the suffering and sees the potential. And if you're holding awareness of potentiality, that keeps your mind steady. And if you're remembering emptiness, it keeps your mind even more steady because you realize how you label suffering and how they label suffering dependent arising. Their ways to freedom, your ways to freedom, dependent arising. And what's more than that, everything is also in flux and changing moment to moment. No one's suffering is permanent. So if this moment feels tragic, the next moment may not be. And things even like grief that lasts for many years has waves and changes the way it feels day to day. So when you're holding the big picture, observing suffering doesn't tire you. But when you're holding a closed picture or very limited view, it does. So that's a good way of understanding if, if you're in something that is close to compassion, but not quite it, is when you're getting tired. But of course, you can also be getting tired just because our mind can't focus for more than a certain length of time. So then things like concentration become really important in fueling your compassion. Because the better your concentration, the more effortless focus and observation of both suffering and potential for freedom are. So all these different practices we're learning about, they weave in together. They're not like separate tools that are used individually. They're ones that eventually all weave in together. It makes sense. But what we want to ask ourselves is right now, what are our assumptions that are actually blocking progress and depth? Because you're nice, compassionate people already. You're wise, good analysts already. But you could be more effective and you could go more deeply if you understand these concepts better, particularly your own experience of them. So pity for sure, attachment for sure, any other kind of near enemies of compassion that like look like it, but actually aren't? It may be. Mm -hmm. Say again? Sympathy. Sympathy, yeah, yeah. Which can be very nice, but it's got a limited affect, yeah. Yep, so pity and like placation and sympathy and attached problem solving. So the ones that um, you didn't mention were placation. And I think this one is, is very prevalent, is very normal, is very human. But basically it's like condescension saying, it'll be okay, <laughs> pat, 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 you know, it's patronizing. And when you're trying to placate someone, it's like you don't want them to suffer because their suffering is annoying. <laughs> you don't want them to suffer because their suffering is disturbing everything. It's not that you don't want them to suffer full stop, period. It's, it's because it's annoying you or it's frustrating you or it's making you feel deficient. And so in response to their suffering, you're trying to get them to not suffer, but really it's like you're trying to squash their suffering. Yeah, and say, could you not, at least right now, because it's aggravating. Makes you feel like sometimes guilty or a failure. Yeah, exactly. 
Exactly. And, and sometimes we do things that are trying to get people to say that they're not suffering anymore because we feel deficient and we wish we could help more. But part of all of this letting go while being engaged is having this open heart that wants them to be free from suffering, knows they can be free of suffering, but also is wise enough to know you are not the only condition in their life. <laughs> Yeah, you are one of countless conditions in their life to help facilitate their release of suffering, to help facilitate their progress towards their potential. So you try to be the best condition you can, but you know you're not the cause. And that you could do your best work, your best empathy, your best listening, your best everything, and it still have no particular positive effect on someone who isn't open or receptive to your style or just not open and receptive that day. And someone who is clumsy and inelegant and inefficient and maybe even superficial and not very smart could say something kind of clunky and cliche and it'd be like perfect and it really helped that person. And you think, what? <laughs> mm. But you know, people's conditions are so different. And so if you just think, I'll be the best condition I can and let go. The pressure's off and you don't fall into that normal tendency of placating or trying to problem solve surface things. And then you don't get so tired. Like this, right? So, and again, I know these are such basic concepts, but it, I'm guessing that you, like me, are very used to seeing the mistakes of humanity play out in front of you but you have to consciously invite that self-awareness back into yourself. I think we take it for granted that we understand these things. We take it for granted and then it just kind of stays at whatever level it was when we first understood it. And it doesn't go any deeper unless we invite it to go deeper. So words can only go so far, um, but really just have this, what am I like? <laughs> what is my near enemy? of compassion? What is my near and my far enemy of compassion? What does it actually look like day to day? It's, it's so it's so vital. So um, I know that you know, these things is the disclaimer, but we're just going to keep coming back to them because experientially, it's important. So we'll go more into compassion next week. But then if we're looking at the far enemy of compassion, this is super easy. What's the opposite of compassion? Yeah, what actively blocks compassion? Blaming, blaming, accusation, to blame, to accuse. Shame, blaming. 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 Yes. <laughs> <laughs> egocentric uh, being, egocentric being. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Egocentric. Exactly. My own suffering. My own suffering. My own... Yeah, your own suffering. Yeah, absolutely. Suffering. Yep. I mean, if if compassion is wanting sentient beings to be free from suffering, then the opposite is wanting them to suffer. And wanting sentient beings to suffer is not something that we often acknowledge is in our own motivation because we're nice people but there's a million tiny ways like passive aggressive ways particularly where we do want someone to suffer like because we'll show a grumpy face and we want that face to communicate our displeasure and for that to have a negative effect on the person and somehow show them something you know so you're like withdrawing affection and then presenting an unkind or a cold face as an act of punishment, but it's so quiet and subtle and polite and socially acceptable that you don't necessarily clarify it as, oh, wow, I just wish someone harm. You know, but I think it's so important that we notice those tiny little slivers of anger as it builds. It's so easy to see the lack of compassion in someone like a world leader invading a country, <laughs> for example, you know, and you watch the news and you think, how could they justify such an action? 
that's missing so much compassion. It's got so much greed. Why, why could you justify that as a human being? It's so illogical. It's so unkind. But we have tiny micro versions of it that could escalate with the right conditions. Yeah. So anyway, opposites of compassion are numerous. We will come back to them. So hate, anger, malice, vindictive retaliation. These are very opposite, very classic opposites. But of course, the things you guys mentioned also apply for sure. So more on this next week. And then I just wanted to review this concept of what is it to know and accept oneself? And what is it to overestimate oneself? This is, again, so easy to see in other people and very hard to acknowledge within ourselves. But it's this overestimation that can be a huge part of burnout. So just remembering that we remember ourselves on a good day when we were present for others and our choices on their behalf were like tangibly useful. We then think that our set of skills are permanent, stable, and consistently helpful in all contexts. And the problem is, is that we have been that one sometimes. The overestimation is hard to dispel because on a good day, you do have those skills. But the problem is, is you've made it your identity. That's who I am as a practitioner. That's who I am as an analyst. That's who I am as a parent. So anytime you don't live up to that, it feels like a failing. When in fact, that was the upper end of your abilities and your more standard abilities were somewhere here in the center, which were also fine. Yeah, so the relationship between overestimation and pride and arrogance and insecurity is very obvious to you guys in viewing other people. But when it's yourself as the practitioner of whatever practice, when that version is not lived up to, you go straight to depression or defensiveness. Rather than just seeing yourself how you are on a normal day. Because you overestimate, you're just always a little disappointed in yourself unless you wind up having a really good day and then you say, oh, that's proof, that's who I am, that's proof. But then the rest of the time on ordinary days, you're just like, oh, not quite, not quite, not quite. And it builds, you know, resentments and sadnesses and all these things which actually brought block progress. So overestimation when we're practicing the four immeasurables or practicing anything is so problematic. And it comes back to this point, which I've said many times, which is we understand intellectually so much earlier than we experience, so much, so much earlier than we integrate. You've known about love your whole life, but you're not consistently loving. And if you identify as consistently loving, you are probably lying to yourself and really lacking self-awareness, right? So it, it's a really important thing to be able to say the things that block love are natural and normal, but they're removable. They are problematic. And I will only be able to grow and deepen my love if I acknowledge the things that stand in opposition to it. Okay, so then you contrast that to knowing and accepting yourself, which is very obvious. We remember that conventionally, we currently, not permanently, have a limited set of skills and abilities that are not always reliable and not always useful. Sometimes our choices facilitate progress towards stable happiness for others as a condition, and sometimes they don't. And that is all fine. <laughs> it is all fine. And neither side is a permanent thing. Okay, so there's countless disadvantages, but this is the thing to keep checking on, is if you're getting depressed or angry or apathetic. If you're depressed, angry, or apathetic with your work or with your life, there's an exaggeration. So when you overestimate yourself, you blame yourself for not being effective when things don't work, or you blame others for not being receptive when things don't work, 
or you blame the system or the strategy when things don't work. So you're depressed, you think it's your fault. You're angry, you think it's their fault. You give up, you think it's the whole system's fault or any concept of variation within this, right? It can go in all sorts of different ways. But if you're feeling down or you're feeling reactive, there's an overestimation that's getting thwarted. And so when you know yourself, you let go without laziness. You enjoy being beneficial without over-identification and you pursue self-awareness. So you're really remembering Buddha potential. And all of this is easiest done if you remember the three spheres of emptiness, right? The agent, the action, the object of any moment in your life, in your work, are empty of inherent existence. You yourself, the agent, the action of whatever it is you're doing, the object towards whatever you're doing, all lack inherent existence because they dependently arise. So remembering this can kind of prevent this overestimation. So that's that's all stuff we were talking about last week, but it's important and it we're gonna build on it with the other immeasurables. So Okay, so there's lots of different aids to love. We won't go into them. Um, I'll send you this PowerPoint. Um, we're going to move on to compassion next week, but just so you know that there's ways to abandon defilements temporary by suppression, not psychological idea of suppression and abandonment that eradicates. So I won't read through all this, but you can read through it when you're, um, you have free time, basically. The whole point here is that there are countless benefits to oneself and others when we practice this accurately, that's very obvious. Um, and this whole section is really powerful. Um, this re reading is a lot about the benefits of love, but specifically in terms of the spiritual path as well as daily life. So some of it will be very easy and obvious, but some of it will be new to you, which is things that we haven't discussed. So I really do recommend you finish the love section of the book. Um, and then next week, we're going to go on to compassion. So finish up the um, refuge section if you haven't already. And um, we'll dedicate all sentient beings who, although self and all appearances are dharmadhatu by nature, have not realized it thus. I shall endow with happiness and the causes of happiness. I shall separate from suffering and the causes of suffering. I shall make inseparable from happiness without suffering, and I shall set in equanimity the cause of well-being, free from attachment, aversion, and partiality. So um, read your book, and we'll see you later today.